Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm Brad Lubin, Extension Associate Professor and Policy Specialist here in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, we especially thank you for joining us on today's webinar because it is in fact a relaunch of our ongoing Thursday webinar series. Since April of 2020, we've offered these sessions nearly every week as part of the Extension Farm and Ranch Management Team uh, here with Nebraska Extension. Late last month, we're excited to announce that our work has transitioned to be part of the new Center for Agricultural Profitability, a center that really encompasses all of our work here uh, at the university in this area. Today marks our first webinar uh, in this series under the name of the new center. Uh, the new center continues our focus on farm and ranch management and offers new opportunities for building collaborations on campus and across the state to support informed economic decision-making for agriculture. Through our webinars, our in-person workshops, regular publications, podcasts, and other outreach efforts, the center will continue to help farmers and ranchers make better decisions and improve their financial position. You can find all of our resources, including Nebraska Ag Land Values, cash rental rates, custom rates, our new Ag Budget Calculator program, and other program areas of, uh, of our focus, all related to farm succession, ag finance, policy, and much more, all at our newly uh, named website, cap.unl.edu, CAP, Center for Ag Profitability, so cap.unl.edu. Amid the discussion of climate smart agriculture and policy proposals for conservation and resource management, there are many ideas and questions about the future of agriculture and conservation efforts. While there may, may be many more developments ahead, there are also very significant programs and opportunities for producers and landowners right now. We wanna take a look at those and look at the growth of conservation program investments over time and the range of opportunities available. We're pleased to be joined by two guests from very important agencies uh, here in Nebraska, uh, agencies of the U United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, both provide important expertise and program insight on these opportunities for producers and landowners. Doug Klein is the Conservation and Price Support Programs Chief with USDA and the Farm Service Agency State Office. Uh, Brad Songson is the Assistant State Conservationist with USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service, also here in, in the NRCS State Office here in Lincoln. We thank you, Brad and, and Doug, both for joining us today. Uh, we want to talk about these issues here momentarily, but I also want to share this, the screen briefly uh, to give you a perspective of uh, the growth in these programs and the significant opportunities for producers uh, that we see over time. All right, are we seeing the full slide? Yep, looks great. Okay. Uh, these conservation program opportunities and, and and for producers and landowners, we're fundamentally talking about the conservation title of the Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill. Recognize that there are many titles. We, in fact, collaborate and, and work closely with these agencies on other issues as well, uh, including work over the last couple of years with uh, USD, with the Farm Service Agency and Doug's colleagues, as we talked about commodity program provisions and enrollment decisions for producers. Today, we wanna to focus on the conservation title of the Farm Bill, Recognize that the conservation title is about 7% of the total farm bill. This pie chart reminds us that most of the farm bill is in fact about food, but the farm portfolio of the farm bill, including crop insurance, commodity programs, conservation programs, and, and others, uh, represents a little bit over 20% of the total bill. Importantly, it's also worth noting conservation is as big as the commodity title. While we spend an awful lot of time on commodity program decisions, conservation programs are just as big, at least in terms of the estimated budget costs uh, as of the time that the Farm Bill was passed. If we think about those programs, we have to acknowledge and, and note that they have grown substantially. Since 1985 and the introduction of the Conservation Reserve Program, uh, conservation program spending in terms of payments to producers uh, across the United States has grown from something less than 500 million to more than $4 billion annually. Now, much of that growth was in the CRP in the late 80s, early 90s, and that has largely been sustained even as the CRP has fluctuated over the years. Also substantial growth in the 90s and into the 2000s 
with the, uh, the working lands programs of EQIP and CSP that uh, we'll be talking about today as well. So recognize substantial growth in these programs and substantial dollars uh, available for producers. Now, in a little bit bigger framework, we think about these policy issues and we think about what these programs will help, can help producers do. There are multiple policy tools here to address important resource and environmental issues. We may see markets solve some of these issues. And particularly as we think about climate smart agriculture and some of the discussion about new uh, carbon sequestration markets and, and other opportunities, there may in fact be market-driven incentives or even government-driven incentives to effectively help create a market for carbon sequestration and other environmental practices. That's important. That's not specifically what we're focused on today. There are also many incentive programs. One of those is not also not a topic today, but cross-compliance or conservation compliance provisions are an important requirement of producers to participate in and, and receive benefits in USDA programs. So while it is not technically a regulation, it's a compliance requirement uh, to be a beneficiary of other programs. And those conservation compliance provisions reach uh, participants in commodity programs, conservation programs, crop insurance programs, et cetera, and reach uh, in excess of 16 million acres a year that are practicing some basic uh, erosion control or wetlands or sod buster protection provisions. Then there are also the voluntary incentive programs, and that's where we'll fundamentally focus here. Uh, and there, of course, is the option to directly regulate. Now, we could get into a whole discussion of regulatory issues, too, from a redefinition or maybe a reworking of the Waters of the United States rule to the ongoing discussion about uh, the America the Beautiful Plan and, and whether there's a national co uh, conservation initiative related to the acronym 30 by 30. Those are important questions. Those two aren't part of today's discussion directly. We're focusing just on the voluntary programs and the tremendous opportunities we see there. In those voluntary programs, you have programs that fundamentally have been focused on retiring land from production. That's the CRP program. Now with the managed haying and grazing features of CRP, it's not exactly completely retired from production, but historically it was about retiring land out of crop production and into a, a conservation uh, use. There are also the working lands programs that provide producers uh, incentives and opportunities on land that continues to, to, to be in operation. And then there are the preservation or easement type programs that help to protect land in its current use or in its uh, uh, preferred or prioritized use, wetland, uh, farmland, conservation, or, or easements, et cetera. And then there is a category of regional conservation partnership programs. I know Brad will talk to this one as well, that really helps to focus and leverage federal and local dollars on specific priorities. But that's sort of a general framework for what we'll talk about today. We also recognize that as I noted, funding has grown substantially over time, but the split of funding has also shifted over time. From the late 80s through the 90s, the substantial portion of conservation programs was focused on the CRP and retiring land out of production into a conservation practice. The real growth since has been in working lands, EQIP and CSP and related programs that actually help provide incentives to manage uh, and, and produce conservation benefits on land that continues to be functioning uh, and productive in agriculture. Now, with that shift over time, we're ready to, to talk about some of the specifics. One more slide to remind us of that growth. I showed you national numbers, but here's the Nebraska number. Uh, total payments to producers as reported by, uh, as estimated by USDA's Economic Research Service, go from less than $10 million per acre or $10 million in the state uh, uh, roughly 35 years ago to uh, in excess of $150 million annually over the last decade or so. Uh, it's a substantial component of uh, incentives to producers and landowners. It's a substantial component of farm income in the state. And so it's an important uh, area of discussion. Having described maybe the overall setting for these programs and, and the framework of, of what they do, uh, we want to look specifically to the experts and to the details. 
I introduced Doug Klein uh, a little bit earlier from uh, USDA's Farm Service Agency uh, state office here in Lincoln. Doug, let me turn it over to you to, to talk about the, uh, the FSA side of this e equation. All right, thank you, Brad. Uh, basically what we're looking at with the conservation program, uh, <clears throat> we're heavy into uh, signups right now. So this is a perfect time for us to, to have this discussion uh, with our sister agency NRCS and, and between the two of us, we predominantly work all of the, the conservation, the CRP uh, program. And you know we, we work very well together with our different expertise that we bring to the table to implement the program. And it basically is a partnership between the two agencies and the producer trying to come up with what, what do they need? What do they want for their particular use of, of their acres? So it, it is a joint effort and, and it does take all three of us to, to make it a success. Uh, both agencies, FSA and NRCS, were part of the federal agencies of, of USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, but we each have separate but similar uh, responsibilities with the overall goal being that we're able to help farmers and ranchers and rural landowners access various federal programming in ways that help them be successful. Uh, in almost all cases, we are generally located in a single USDA service center across, uh, across Nebraska in, in county offices. Um, generally, like I said, we're, we're co-located, but there are a few that have separate NRCS offices and I'll let Brad discuss those when, when it's uh, his presentation. Doug, if I can interrupt you briefly to say, are you, yes. ready, are you ready to share your slides as well? Yes. Are they not coming across? Not yet. We'll make sure that works. That's working here. Is it coming across now? No, we, we don't see you sharing yet. Uh, are you able to re to to re hit the share screen uh, button on your on your Zoom? I thought I had. <clears throat> Let me try it again. There we go. Now we're now we're seeing your uh, okay. email, so we're close. Are you seeing the slide now? Uh, no, we're seeing your we're seeing your uh, email, so we're, we must be seeing your other screen. Let me try this again. All right, we see the we see the screen with the PowerPoint. Terrific. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, again, we do have 71 county offices across Nebraska for FSA offices. Uh, some of them have a combination of both uh, farm program, commodity loans, uh, various conservation programs. And then some of them have both the, the, F, the farm loan uh, arm of our operation also. But now any of the 71 offices would have available those capabilities. So. Some of them have directly in the office, the farm loan staff, and some of them have it through connection with, uh, through a multi-county service area. So as you can see on this screen, we've got the blue and the green. The, the blue uh, represents where the farm loan staff is located and, and the green is where we have both combination and then the white, we don't have a physical location, but either the blue or green county service those white county areas. To find the nearest one, um, go to offices.usda.gov, and that will give you the access to those locations. The program portfolio, uh, as you can see, 
we've got listed under farm programs. We have safety net, disaster programs, conservation programs, which is gonna be the main theme of my discussion today. And under the uh, farm loan portfolio, we have direct ownership, guaranteed farm ownership, micro loans, beginning farmers, youth loans, farm storage facility loans, as well as other types of loans. The conservation reserve program, what is it? Uh, it basically is designed to provide erosion controls, uh, soil and water erosion control, uh, implement habitat for wildlife, and in a, in a manner to clean water and, and also to make available options for producers that maybe have an area of, of their farm that are struggle to, to be profitable. But this is one option that may be available. Voluntary uh, gives producers the, the opportunity to take environmentally sensitive land out of production and put it into a, a resource conserving and or wildlife friendly habitat. Uh, generally the contract <clears throat> contracts are 10 to 15 years long. Uh, and with 2018, the farm bill raised that CRP cap up to 27 million acres nationwide. In Nebraska, we generally have been running at about a little over a million acres each year that we have in, in the Conservation Reserve Program. We annually provide the, the opportunity for producers and landowners to offer the land for enrollment. Uh, we generally have a general CRP as well as a grassland CRP sign up. And then we have an ongoing uh, sign up that we call continuous CRP. And each of these have different focus areas for different types of practices. We also do have some special CRP initiatives such as the uh, Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, or referred to as the CREP program, and then also state acres for wildlife enhancement that's referred to as the Safe Acres Program. Today, we're generally, we will be focusing on the general, the grassland, and continuous CRP signup. These currently are open or will soon be opening. As you can see, the general and continuous are open right now and then grassland starts uh, July 12th. For that CRP and grassland, the, the process is competitive and the acres offered for enrollment are compared and ranked against each other. And, and this is done at a national level. And it's based off of that, that comparison is based off of environmental benefit index and to score those indexes, this is what it is looked at. We, the wildlife habitat benefit, the water quality benefit, on-farm benefit, air quality benefits, and then last is the cost of implementation. So these applications are scored on a national level following signup. So after we have the close of signup, then it usually takes at least uh, several weeks on a national level to review all of the offers and score them based on their EBI scores to come up with what will be the uh, cutoff level for acceptance. Eligibility for CRP, uh, the producer needs to have owned or operated that land for at least the 12 months prior to the close of the sign up for either general or the grassland. For cropland, it must be planted to an ag commodity <clears throat> four of the six crop years from the years 2012 through 2017. So out of that, that 2012 to 2017 year period, four of those six crop years need to have been planted to an ag commodity. In addition for the general signup, the land has to meet one of the following three criteria. Have an erosion index of eight or higher, be enrolled in CRP contract that expires September 30th of this year, September 30 of 2021, or be located in a national or state priority area. Now, one, one option or caveat that could come into play on that 12 month ownership is if you inherited ground uh, through the, the death of the prior owner, that will qualify using the, that methodology and, and you, may, you would not end up having to have 12 months of ownership yourself. 
The CRP payments, uh, the annual rental payments to the landowner are based on productivity of the soils in the county and average dry land cash rent data. And we gather this through a methodology where we also take a look at the soil productivity index as part of that rental rate determination process. So we are looking at uh, soils that are more productive will get a higher rental rate, higher than county average. Soils that are of lesser productivity would be less than the county average. So this is something that we have started using uh, with the 2018 Farm Bill and now uh, was announced with this last during 2021 that we would be using that soil productivity. The payment is subject to 85% proration for general and 90% proration for continuous. So we'll calculate the rental rate and then it's 85% of that is what would be the general and 90% for the continuous sign up, depending on which one you're signing up for. Now, a producer may <clears throat> choose to offer the land at a rate lower than that rental rate and that does provide additional points under the EBI and the competitiveness for the cost of the implementing the program. The CRP grasslands rate is based on 75% of the NAS pasture rental rate. So that is something that we do obtain that information from NAS. And that's one of the reasons it's important that, that over the years we've, we've tried to recommend producers make sure they, they send in those survey results to NAS because this is one way that they can have an effect on rental rates. And then the landowner also gets incentive payments for establishing certain practices and can get cost share for establishing certain practices. So it, it does vary. Um, some of the ones that we'll be looking at for higher incentives for those signups, and it can be from three, five, or 10% increase for the practices that increase carbon sequestration or reduce greenhouse gas as, as two examples of, of ways that you can, can get an incentive. For CRP practices, what do we mean by that? I mean, what, what constitutes a practice? Under the general CRP signup, we're looking at where you're establishing introduced grasses and legumes or a native grass planting. You may wanna add some tree plantings, uh, wildlife habitat, habitat corridor in between large pieces of, of grass areas or, or CRP, a food plot. Uh, there's rare and declining species habitat so that you can specifically put cover practices or practice cover that has those rare and declining habitats and then pollinator habitat. Those are all under the general CRP practices. Under continuous, these are generally looking at uh, smaller acres that are going to serve as a filter, a riparian, a prairie strip, a windbreak, shelter braid, or li living snow fence, or grass waterways. So generally under the continuous CRP, those practices you're looking at smaller areas where under the general CRP, you're looking at larger areas you know, uh, such as a whole quarter or 40 acres or, you know, bigger areas that you're introducing a larger practice and a larger cover on those practices. So in, in a very broad perspective, how does the application process work? Uh, this is something that we look at and, and we try to, to make sure that producers understand when they walk into our office Here's kind of the starting point, uh, identifying the land that you would like to enroll in CRP and start initiating that CRP contract offer with FSA. Now that doesn't mean you couldn't also have a discussion with NRCS and then have some idea of what you're looking at, come over to the FSA office and then start the CRP contract offer. We then submit that offer to the national office by the signup deadline or shortly thereafter. Those offers are then ranked across the nation. Again, it's looking at that EBI scoring mechanism and the national office establishes what's, what will be the ranking cutoff based off those environmental benefit index to, to determine which offers will be extended and, and offer of acceptance. 
those landowners then who have accepted offers, in other words, they're, they score higher than that national ranking cutoff, they do receive a letter letting them know that their offer has been, has met that, and they will then have the opportunity to continue and, and proceed with that offer and, and work with NRCS to develop a conservation plan or the CPO for the acres being offered. Now, it's very important that the landowners and, and the person on that contract understand that as they're working with that CPO, they come up with, between them and, and working with NRCS, the acceptable plan that they want to put on the land. So it's something that it's a discussion item that needs to be you know, discussed pretty deeply. Here's, here's what I would like to have on the land. Here's what you can do under this particular practice. So it, it is a, a give and take between NRCS or the wildlife biologist to the technical service provider to work with and develop what do you want to have in that CPO and can that CPO then meet the requirements of, for what you have signed up. So it is it's something that is a mutual discussion item. And certainly if you have any questions or concerns, make sure you're raising those with the, the person you're working with so that you fully understand what you're putting on this CRP land. Here's some of the changes that have occurred this year. Um, some of the high points for general and, and continuous CRP, there is a one-time 10% inflationary adjustment in effect that's trying to account for inflation over that 10 or 15 year period that your land has been contract. For grassland contracts, the minimum uh, rental rate will be $15 per acre. So under that <clears throat> grassland, and that does affect uh, quite a bit of the panhandle area of Nebraska, that the $15 minimum is going to come into play. Uh, we also are looking at adjustment of soil rental rates up or down based on the soil productivity index, as I discussed earlier, if, if the land that you're, the soil that you're enrolling is, is better than average land in the county, you would have a bump up in your rental rate. If it's uh, le less than half of the uh, productivity of the county average, then you would have a little bit lower than that rental rate. Also have increased incentive practices to, to try and encourage adoption of practices that sequester carbon and or reduce emissions. Once that final paperwork has been put together and, and signed, then uh, in most instances, the CRP contract will start on October 1 of the calendar year, and that is the start of our fiscal year and program year. So. Uh, generally, our contracts start October 1. Uh, we do have some programs that they can start within, you know, a shorter period after signing of those, uh, the CPO and, and the Conservation Reserve Program contract. So once you've got the contract signed, then you begin uh, working to establish the cover as outlined in your, your conservation plan of operation. And there are rules about how soon this can be completed. So that's something you need to be very uh, cognizant of is what is in my CPO? Uh, when am I supposed to intercede or when am I supposed to maybe do a, a kill down of, of the existing cover to maybe intercede? So that's very important that you understand what is in that CPO. There are required management activities on the CRP acres when they're accepted into the program. <clears throat> you do have to you know, keep noxious weeds under control, uh, make sure the cover is maintained. And if it is damaged, is it something that uh, you you would be able to, that you've got to get it reseeded possibly? Uh, you know, did a, a accidental spray kill some of it? That's the type of thing that you've got to maintain and you are expected in exchange for receiving the CRP annual rental payments that you are expected to maintain those covers at levels that meet the, the conservation plan of operation, as well as the practice levels for certain diversity of, of cover and, and different things like that. So very important you understand what your CPO is, is directing you to do. 
current signups that we've got right now, uh, we are in our general CRP signup through July 23rd. Our grassland signup starts July 12th <clears throat> and runs through August 20th. And then our continuous signup is ongoing, but does shut off on August 6th. So right now, these are the three uh, program signup deadline periods that we have. And so you do have the opportunity to, to take a to take a chance or get into all three of those right now if you needed to. One item that uh, we have had some discussion on is clear 30, but and it was important that we provide this information so that everybody understands. Clear 30 was a special initiative that came about from the uh, 2018 Farm Bill. And it, the CLEAR 30 stands for Clean Lakes, Estuaries, and Rivers. And the 30 represents that these contracts are for a 30-year period. And initially, these, the CLEAR 30 program was a pilot program that was available in the Chesapeake Bay area and the Great Lakes regions of, across the country. But those were the only two locations that you could sign up for those. Uh, this now has been opened up across the nation, and it is based on certain practices that meet the estuary, lake, and river uh, criteria. And in Nebraska, um, it, we have about 640 contracts that have got the this, this specific practices that are available for this program. And it does have to be a contract that is expiring this September 30 of 2021 you would be able to re-enroll those now if you wanted to with this CLEAR 30 process. So it has to be currently enrolled or going to be re-enrolled for the certain practices that maintain that water quality benefit of the practice. Um, and it does have annual rental payments equal to the current continuous CRP rental rate plus a 20% quality incentive for water quality. And there's also a 27.5% um, annual rental adjustment, which takes into account over that 30 year period, uh, what happens with inflation. So that's what that does. The landowners are eligible in Nebraska, that are eligible in Nebraska, will receive a letter alerting them to this sign up option. And this sign up does end August 6th of 2021. So those letters all have already gone out. And I believe those started going out uh, sometime after June 14th. So they should be out and uh, those producers would have the option to sign up. Like I said, we've got approximately 640 uh, existing CRP contracts that qualify for this option. It is voluntary and it is something that a producer makes the decision whether they want to continue it or not. Information for the FSS CRP, uh, as you can see on this screen, you can go to farmers.gov, www.farmers.gov, conserve, uh, www.fsausda.gov, nebraskaapf.com. So there's various sources here that you can get the information. Doug, thank you very much uh, you for the presentation. Uh, uh, important information on FSA's role and, and the details of the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, I want to turn it over here to Brad momentarily, but let me uh, say something that, that I did in the beginning, which is uh, we're happy to take your questions. Uh, there's a QA and a uh, box or, or tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Click on that and, and type in your question, and we'll uh, compile those and, and return to those after the end of, the, of both presentations. So please don't hesitate to, to do those. Um, Brad, let me turn it over to you and, and welcome your comments on the, uh, the NRCS side of this discussion. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Brad. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk about the programs. Uh, I will share my screen. And uh, are you seeing my, my slide there? Looks, looks good, yes. Okay, well, I will uh, we'll spend just a few minutes uh, kind of giving a high level overview of some of our programs and then um, 
um, try to leave time at the end for questions. So just very briefly wanted to uh, give you an overview of our agency. Uh, we're the Nebraska Natural Resources Conservation Service. And our uh, the agency motto has been for many years, uh, we're helping people help the land. So it's, uh, we're primarily a, a planning agency uh, going back 85 years uh, when the agency was established. So there is a, a precedent uh, longstanding uh, where we are one of the primary USD agencies that work on private lands uh, within this country. So uh, it, all of our programs are based on working lands uh, with um, making uh, practices uh, that we offer and pay for to be compatible with uh, production agriculture. So uh, it's all tied to uh, resource concerns, um, you know, be it water, soil, plants, habitat, and those kind of things, that's our mission. So for uh, assistance, I mentioned that we do offer the financial, or the technical assistance, but also financial assistance, which, is, uh, which comes to us through the, uh, the farm bills, which are established, uh, rewritten and reapproved uh, generally every five or six years. But the assistance that is provided by NRCS is free of charge uh, and participation in NRCS programs is voluntary. We're a non-regulatory agency. Um, and so um, the technical assistance um, side of, of uh, the, our agency, you know, comes through different uh, field offices. I will show a map here in just a minute, but um, you know, the first step for anyone would be to uh, contact one of our field offices uh, to begin the process. We have a what we call a nine-step uh, process for planning, and it all starts with with uh, assessing your resources. We like to. Um, work with with a producer it's your land nobody knows it better than than you and so we want to uh, see what your goals are um, what kind of of needs do we have do we have some erosion issues do we have some plant uh, issues and those so it all starts with the resource assessment then we get into uh, designing practices different monitoring activities um, uh, when it, and then that might lead to a contract to uh, install some practices. And the planning comes first, and then that uh, uh, would lead to a decision on your part, uh, whether to sign up for uh, CRP, for example, or uh, some of the other uh, programs we have available. So to uh, piggyback a little bit with Doug on, on the CRP, I just thought I would show an example of how the technical assistance may work. Uh, NRCS, um, we provide the technical assistance for CRP to both FSA and to the landowner during that whole process. So Doug outlined uh, how you go about getting a, a contract approved and what that takes. Once the landowner is, is notified of an acceptance of that offer, then NRCS will step in, the landowner would contact us, and we would work to develop that conservation plan. So that, that's things like the seeding sheets, what, what is gonna be seeded, uh, the management practices uh, throughout to uh, keep that uh, cover viable throughout the length of the contract, and do the cost estimates we would develop uh, plan maps, soil maps, um, and all of those. So once all of that is agreed to uh, by both sides, then the producer would sign that that plan, and then that would be returned back to the Farm Service Agency. So other things that uh, are involved with the technical assistance on CRP, Again, doing that practice plan. Uh, ideally, some of this discussion would happen before a sign up. Doug mentioned the uh, sign up deadlines for some of these programs. If possible, 
go in and, and talk to the NRCS service center, to the technicians, to get an idea of, of which practices might fit your, your farm the best. And then uh, the practice design, installation, um, we handle the certification for payments. Uh, there's several field reviews which happen uh, in relation to this initially, and then um, in three or four years to determine whether the cover has been established, for example, and any guidance for management practices and those, um, you can contact the NRCS to get, to get that information. The technical assistance, once the planning is done um, and you, we have determined with you what uh, practices you need, then we start looking at, at the uh, different options available, EQIP, RCPP, CSB, ASAP. And again, uh, the, fun, the funds are made available through the farm bills. We're currently working under the 2018 farm bill, which was signed into law by the president on December of 2018. Uh, here's a quick look at the, at the structure <clears throat> uh, for NRCS and the field offices. We have 77 field offices across the state. General, you can choose whichever field office you wish to contact initially. Generally, that would be the closest field office to your operation. So you can locate your service centers at, uh, at this website the www.farmers.gov service center locator and make an appointment, especially in this time of, of the COVID with, uh, with the restrictions on, on uh, some staffing and, and numbers that can be in the offices. I strongly encourage you to make an appointment uh, to schedule so that um, our staff can, can be available when it works for you. And then think about different uh, documents that you would uh, need to establish a contract, uh, such as banking information, um, any power of, of attorney, uh, paperwork, those, those kinds of things are needed um, right up front and, and we can start to get that in the system so that we can move forward quickly. And then of course have a plan and we'll talk about what you see for your farm. Uh, a little bit more. So when when we do meet, uh, that's when we're going to uh, discuss your conservation goals. Um, we're going to talk about conservation compliance provisions. There are wetland and highly rotable land uh, eligibilities. There's some uh, adjusted gross income eligibility. We'll talk about all of that with you at that time. And if if we're ready, then we would um, take an application and, and get, uh, get your contact information. Then after the meeting, um, we'll stay in touch and, and talk about all the different options that are available. So <clears throat> when, when all of that is, is completed, <clears throat> we, get the, we get the upfront work done, then we're ready to apply for the programs and you can apply for any of these programs. I'm gonna talk about very briefly at any time. It's a continuous sign up, but we do have some cutoff dates uh, throughout the year that uh, where we will take all the applications that we have on hand. And then we have to rank those applications because funding always falls well short of the number of applications that we have uh, to fund. So there's a ranking process. Application announcements are available online and news releases throughout the year. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the different programs, the EQIP, that's our, uh, the most general and wide ranging program that we have. Um, it's, uh, we can uh, apply multiple practices for any of the environmental concerns through EQIP. Uh, generally, uh, in Nebraska, we average you know, about between 900 to 1100 contracts every year. And um, we receive applications, uh, roughly 3,500 to 4,000 applications a year. So it's highly competitive. And so um, we do need to make sure that uh, we're focusing on the highest priority concerns that you have to give you the best chance to get a contract. Some of the practices, uh, like I say, wide ranging, uh, no-till cover crops, windbreaks. Um, there's 
a list of over uh, 60 practices which are eligible through EQIP, uh, popular in, in Nebraska, uh, irrigation practices, uh, terraces for erosion control, nutrient management, cover crops, uh, any of those are eligible. So the RCPP uh, program, this is one of our more recent programs uh, was established in the 2008 Farm Bill. But this is a program where we uh, bring in partners such as uh, NRDs, uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Nebraska Game and Parks and others. And this is a, a fun leveraging uh, program. Uh, to focus on, on uh, specific priority areas in a state. So we currently have nine active RCPP projects in Nebraska. Uh, just for as an example, there's about $15 million of federal funds committed uh, generally through RCPP uh, uh, project would get funded at about a one-to-one -one, uh, matching funds to federal funds requirement. Um, so with the 15 million, we're committing about $30 million to uh, apply practices here in the state with the current RCPP projects. So here's a list of uh, some of the RCPP projects we have. You can read more about these on our website. So CSP, uh, CSP is uh, one of our more popular uh, programs within the agency. Uh, CSB began in the uh, 2002 Farm Bill, and it continues to be popular. But CSP is, is where uh, you would get paid for uh, practices and conservation you currently have established on your farm, and then you would receive payments uh, to take uh, to ad add additional uh, practices and uh, additional conservation benefits. So payment for ability on existing efforts, and then uh, uh, you would strengthen the operation through additional practices. These are five-year contracts, and again, it's voluntary. Um, I would uh, note that CSP requires that, that you would enroll your entire operation um, so that uh, uh, we're, we're doing the resource assessment on the entire operation instead of just a, a portion such as would be through EQIP. Again, some of the practices, um, all of the, the practices are eligible that cover cross pest management nutrient. It does have a kind of a unique uh, payment structure. I won't go into detail on this, but there are some what we call activity payments where you get paid on existing conservation practices that uh, you have already established. Those are concerns met. And then there are additional payments uh, on a per acre basis uh, for new practices and enhancements. Nationally, there's 150 million acres in CSB. Uh, here in Nebraska, we've had about 11 million acres enrolled, which puts Nebraska at about um, fifth or sixth in the country in the number of acres enrolled on an annual basis. I'm gonna touch on ASAP. Um, this is our ag land easements. So uh, ASAP has two components. There's an ag land easement, uh, a working lands a component and a wetland reserve component to restore wetlands. Um, ALA, ALE, ag land easements, uh, protect the current ag use and conservation values. So it's to keep uh, ag land in the current uh, state of, of cropping or grazing uh, conditions and the purpose is to keep uh, their land into ag uses is uh, the purpose of ALE. WRE is, is to restore wetland habitat and enhance wetland habitat um, on a property. There's a payment structure uh, uh, which we determined uh, the value based on uh, appraisals currently. We also have geographic area rate caps in some cases, which would tell you what, uh, what the payment rates would be. So there's various uh, methods to determine a, uh, a value for those easements. And then the uh, landowner can submit an offer as well. Currently, uh, gives you a snapshot of where we are in the state. Uh, since 2010 or about 2012, we've uh, enrolled 42 new easements, 
WRE easements and seven new ALE easements. So it's popular since uh, its inception in 1996 in Nebraska, we have, there are about 700 easements within the state, uh, both ALE and um, wetland reserve easements. So um, in, in wrapping up here, just a little bit, I did wanna to touch on uh, the, with the limited funds, we, we are required to uh, set some priorities and establish some ranking tools. And we do that, we get input from local work groups, um, which uh, are set up uh, on every NRD level. The, these local work groups are open to the public and, and where we gather input on what the priority resource concerns are, uh, the recommendations on our payment schedules and in different ways that we operate these programs. So um, that, was, that was very quick, Brad, but uh, hopefully uh, if there's questions, we can, we can address those. So thank you. Brad, thank you very much for the insight. To, I, you know, I get to see you report on these things at state technical committee meetings and, and know how valuable it is to have a chance to share this with the broader public as well. So um, appreciate the, the information and the update there. Uh, we'll invite Doug back to the uh, microphone as well. And uh, we do have a number of questions and we have some time here to, uh, to address some questions um, that, uh, that, are, that are critical here. Um, one of them uh, is, is a, sort of an amended version of a, of a participant question, uh, but it related specifically to, uh, uh, can you combine FSA or NRCS program participation with some state and local incentives? Uh, and thinking particularly as a question about buffer, the buffer strips program, but you could also add opportunities with conservation groups or wildlife groups uh, on habitat plantings and other, other types of incentives. How does that work together? Uh, what's allowed or, or how does a producer and landowner uh, work on that? Okay, well, General, I'll take- Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll take a shot then Doug, you can uh, kick in, but- all, all, all those programs can work in conjunction and together. Um, and, and we do routinely uh, utilize uh, the different programs. And that's part of that, that technical is the planning part of it uh, to determine you know, who's got uh, practice, who's got funding available. Uh, you mentioned uh, filter strips, for example, the uh, uh, Nebraska Department of Agriculture, they offer some payments through for, for a buffer strip program that they have, we, you, we could utilize that and they could also have an, an equip contract on part of the land and they could also then have a CRP contract. So they are definitely uh, uh, interchangeable. So. The only thing I would add is uh, as a general rule, yeah, like, like Brad said, th that capability is there. One of the things you have to be not cautious of, but aware of is how can you mesh different programs and, and make it all work. And so like, like Brad indicated, different, there's different groups that have got some incentive money that maybe this year is available, next year may not be, you know, kind of depends on, on what the focus is, but certainly that's one of those things where, you know, sit down and, and let's have that discussion and see what's available. And then again, it comes down to the, that producer making the decision, yes, this does work for me, or no, that doesn't quite work, maybe need to try something different, but ultimately, you know, come in and sit down and, and have that discussion so that you know exactly what the, the program is set up for and what your conservation plan is gonna be entailing. All right, uh, Doug, two questions about CRP and specifically about Clear 30. Um, First one is a contractual question. If, if you're enrolled in Clear 30, obviously a 30 year commitment, how does that uh, affect potential transition of, of the farmland uh, through an estate or, or through a sale? That does come into play. And, and uh, short of if, if there's a, like the, the death of the previous owner, that does provide the opportunity for somebody to, to get out of that contract. But um, when, if you're looking at a producer that is out of compliance, then that is going to be, you know, an issue that you're going to have to pay back, you know, all of the, the 
funding and, and that you've received on it. But that is something that that's the inf type of information that when you come into our office, we'll sit down and we have that discussion in detail. So you do know exactly what, what you're looking at because 30 years is a long time. And there are certainly scenarios that would allow the, the producer to not end up having to repay it. And, and the key thing is if, if you've maintained compliance or not. And maybe more simply, Doug, if, if a landowner enrolls in Clear 30 and then passes on, the heir inherits the contract and continues it on? Is that the general expectation? Yeah, they have that opportunity to continue it on then. Okay. Uh, there were the other question about Clear 30 uh, uh, relates to the inflation adjustment. You mentioned that was, I believe, a 27.5% uh, adjustment. Is that a single? adjustment and then that flat rate is paid over 30 years or is that scaled up over the contract that i'm look i'm trying to find exactly how that is set up and i don't know that i have got that at the moment i'm looking at the fact sheet and it doesn't really say how it's calculated it just says 27 and a half rental percent rental rate enhancement and that's something that uh, if you're interested what i would suggest is contact your local office. Uh, we are still in the process of getting additional information out to our field offices. And so that's something that is, you know, I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. that is something that we would be able to provide it as you have an interest in the program. I, I think it's fair to say, generally speaking, economically, we expect that that is, that is supposed to be sufficient to account for inflation over time. It's not yeah. meant to provide an additional bonus that gets you extra return. It's, it's meant to cover inflationary expectations given the length of the contract. Correct. Okay. Uh, there is one more question on Clear 30 as, as we're going. Uh, it's available now. Do we, do we know how long or, or beyond current opportunities, whether Clear 30 is a permanent, uh, is it now a national pilot or is it a permanent program? We don't know that for sure yet. All we do know is that at the moment, it's available for existing CRP contracts under those under specific water quality practices that are expiring this September 30, 2021. Now, beyond that, uh, the expectation is that certainly next year, September 30, 2022, those contracts that would be expiring at that time a year from now those would be available but it, we don't know if it's going to be something that will be opened up to new enrollment or if it's going to continue to be existing expiring each year so that that type of detail we don't have yet okay uh brad a, a couple questions for you uh there's a question relating to partnerships and it's asking about csp but i'm thinking perhaps it's more of the RCPP. How does, how does one, how does a producer or landowner with, with an idea or, or a, uh, uh, you know, with, with a goal, find partners to work with? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, in, in Nebraska, the place I would start would be with uh, one of the, the natural resource districts to get started or uh, with the, uh, uh, state agencies such as Nebraska Game and Parks. And these uh, partners have to be uh, an agency or an organization which can hold a, and manage agreements and manage funds. So uh, these aren't set up to be uh, just a small group of landowners, for example. Um, and then probably the best and easiest would be just just come in and talk to us at NRCS and and run your your thoughts and and ideas past us and then through the local work group meeting state technical uh, contacts that we have we can get the ball rolling uh, to uh, get a project started and that that would is for both um, uh, RCPP and uh, and any other program so. Uh, Brad, also a question about uh, WRP. Um, what are the opportunities looking ahead for, for more WRP enrollment in the state? Or technically, I, we should be talking about uh, uh, the uh, ASAP program and, and the, the wetlands uh, uh, easements, but particularly along the Elkhorn River Basin, where we're still sort of discovering 
the damages of the flooding from 2019 and, and maybe some new, uh, uh, new priorities. What sort of growth or what sort of opportunities do you see going forward there? Uh, so we see, we, we're optimistic that there's going to be uh, funding, maybe, maybe even an increased funding for ASAP. So again, uh, it's a continuous sign up a year round. And uh, I would, uh, again, get into the, the field office. Uh, we'll sign an application. We can sign those at any time. And the earlier, the better, because uh, there's some, some assessments that we have to do to uh, and rank those applications. And we uh, are expecting to have uh, the next cutoff date sometime early fall. So uh, the earlier they can get in to sign up and then we can start looking at it and, and deciding whether it's, a, it's a, a good application or not and how you can strengthen that application. So uh, come in and sign an application at any time. Brad, I also noted uh, the way the question was worded, it reminded me that sometimes we have to remember the shifting acronyms. Uh, what we're now talking about as the Wetland Reserve Easement uh, Program as a component of ASEP, the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, uh, is, is the, the component that used to be referred to as the Wetland Reserve Program. So WRP is now part of ASEP. Uh, That's and, right. Um, so the goals haven't changed or, or uh, but the acronyms may have, so it's important to, to keep track of them. Yep, that's correct. Um, the, uh, Doug, a couple of questions back to you. Um, first, there was a question about uh, uh, collecting seed on CRP acres. The permanent habitat, some of those native plantings on CRP acres, uh, that, that seed production is potentially valuable. Is that, a, is that an allowable practice to, to collect that? It wouldn't work to give uh, cost share reimbursement because we have to have certified seed that's been you know, processed and, and billed. If you were collecting seed and, and spreading it on your own, uh, that's not going to work for our purposes. I mean, certainly if you added those to something that, you've all, that you're officially putting on as your cover, you know, that's certainly not gonna hurt anything, but it's not gonna be an eligible scenario where you'd get cost share as that being your, your practice that was used to establish the cover. So, so don't, don't envision harvesting your own seed for purposes that's, that's of you using it to establish cover under another contract. That's but if correct. you collect, but if you collect seed and use it on your own property for other purposes, that may be acceptable or does that Certainly. violate the procedure? I mean, yeah, because that, there's no difference between that really and, and it blowing in or in being transported in by wildlife. Uh, that That's the type of scenario where, yeah, there's some additional stuff being brought in, but you know, is it going to meet the specifics for the diversity of the practice you've chosen? It may or may not. So Understood. that's something that you can't, I would not plan on it. Okay. Um, we're going to wrap up shortly here. Uh, a note to all our participants uh, as we as we roll just past the one o'clock hour, but we do have a couple questions uh, remaining. Um, uh, more related to that to the CRP question, uh, can you can you give us a a very brief insight on the Safe program and and what producers and landowners should know about that and and maybe the direction where do we go for more info. All I can give you on the SAFE program is that we're in the process at the national level, they're reworking uh, some of the criteria and emphasis on the SAFE program. And so I don't have any real ability to, to identify, here's where the SAFE program is going in, the, in this year or in the next year. So unfortunately, I can't really give you that type of detail about the SAFE program. Okay, all right. Um, one, one general question, are all programs available in all counties? I, I presume the answer is you can go to any county and start the process. Yes. But different areas obviously have different priorities and different, uh, uh, maybe different enhancements, right? Exactly, exactly. You know, if you're, if you're in the Southeast part of the state and the CRP options would be different than if you're up in the Sand Hills area. Okay. Um, the, there was a question, uh, um, addressed uh, here directly to a, to a participant asking about beginning farmer and rancher programs, but I think it's worth a general note. 
um, both the uh, programs implemented through FSA and through NRCS do have some features that allow for what extra benefits or, or opportunities for beginning farmers and ranchers, I believe, right? We yeah, do. So, go yeah. ahead, Brad. Go ahead, yeah, Brad. I, I would just, just throw in the uh, for the NRCS programs, uh, we do uh, establish this, uh, funds specifically for beginning farmers, ranchers, and socially disadvantaged. And uh, EQIP actually has a mandated uh, 5% for each. Mm -hmm. And we do also have under uh, the CRP program an option where uh, maybe somebody is in the considering retiring or is otherwise going to want to transition that, pro that CRP contract to a beginning farmer. So we do have capability of, of where they can get up to two additional years of rental payments by doing that. So that's called the transition incentive program or the TIP program. Again, contact your county office. Uh, one question I did see that they were asking what are specific carbon sequestration practices. Mm -hmm. what, to answer that, what I would suggest is going into your local office because there's a large list of CRP practices that are called the climate smart practices. And that's something you would, you would need to go into your local office and find out which ones are would you would be workable in, in your area, but there is a large list of those. Okay, and I, Brad, I think that that question on carbon sequestration relative to NRCS programs as well, uh, right? There might be many practices that have a carbon uh, emissions benefit. Um, yes, yeah, that's that's right, um, and there's. There are certain practices which are identified and, and uh, for carbon sequestration and then the where you use them and how you apply them will all make a difference. Yeah. To date, none of the programs specifically pay for carbon uh, or carbon sequestration or other greenhouse gas emissions reductions. They pay for practices uh, and, and enrolled acres, um, but, uh, but Keep your eyes open, right? We'll, we'll see what comes of, of future uh, policy discussions. Um, one more question on CRP related to cost share. Uh, as we implement a CRP contract and we're, we're uh, having to do establishment and so forth, are, what kind of cost share provisions, if any, uh, relate to those practices? Um, that's, those are the, the standard CRP contract or the cost share um, is at 75%. Okay. All right. Um, Doug, one more detailed question on, on the CRP. You mentioned that rental rates are now reflective of not just county averages, but also of soil productivity. Uh, is, that a, is that a case where we now know, a, or we have an index of rental rates? Is that by soil type or soil classification level or something, but there's some, is there some available list that gives us a, uh, uh, that gives us the information on what the relative rental rates are across soil types? That's part of what is available when they come in and look at the CPO. And I have to admit, I did, I just did misspeak. I said 75% for cost share and actually it's 50%, but their different practices have additional incentives. So, you have to look at what practice are you looking at as to which, what's going to be your cost share. All right, all right. Um, one final question, maybe it's a way to summarize what you, uh, what you both have available through your agencies. Um, there are so many programs and there are so many practices and, and literally there are, I think hundreds of practices, right? If you look in the manual, how does a producer or a landowner start? Do they look at a program and try and figure out what they can do with it? Or do they look at a practice and say, which program can help me? Uh, what's the best way to start and, and where do we go? Well, again, uh, the, the best approach would be to contact the NRCS or FSA and go in and, and start there and, and talk about what, what are the concerns? Uh, what issues are you having? Is it water quality? Is it the soil health? Those kind of things. Because uh, there may be uh, 
several programs that can help address that concern. So the first part would be a resource assessment and what, what, uh, what types of things need to be uh, improved or fixed. Good. Start with the issues and the goals and the conservation process will help you figure out which practices and, and programs. Okay. Right. All right. Well, as we close this up, uh, we also have uh, Bobby Chris Wickham, uh, the uh, public relations officer with FSA. And, and Bobby, if you want to come on, you've got one more bit of info you can share with us here. Yeah, um, there were a lot of great questions today. And I just wanted to say in, in a lot of our answers said, you know, contact your county office, right? Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know if they're not familiar with their county offices, all you need to do is type the words offices.usda.gov into your internet browser and click on your state and click on your county and then you'll get that contact information for your, for your local office. Um, all of our offices are open for in-person appointments, but you, you do have to have an appointment uh, due to COVID restrictions. Um, we've got to have a, a, an appointment. So call ahead, get an appointment, um, and then our offices, our staff there will try to work with you the best way possible, either through in-person, phone, email. We've learned a lot of different tools and lots of different ways to communicate mm -hmm. over the last year. So, And, and in-person still helps for many things. Uh, the, lot of, lots of contact electronically, email and phone, but right. sometimes that in-person visit is still a critical part. Right, yes. So now I say that as we're delivering a webinar. So uh, we appreciate <laughs> the fact that technology allows us to do this. I thank you all for your time uh, today and, and thank you for your indulgence of, of going over our hour. But questions were great and it's, it's important to have that chance to, uh, to share them here today. So I thank you. Uh, Brad, and thank you, Doug, and, and Bobby, thank you for helping to collaborate and coordinate and, and deliver this information today. I also thank all of you that are still on here that participated today. Uh, well, more than uh, a majority of our participants uh, are still on here uh, after 70 plus minutes, but uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, remember that we can reach more as well, and if you have some details you want to go back and revisit, remember that a recording of this webinar will be posted on our website. Again, CAP unl.edu. Uh, you can find the recording of that this webinar up there soon. You can also find information on our upcoming webinars uh, and registration information as well. Uh, today, please check your email a little bit later or today or maybe the next day uh, for a brief survey about the webinar. We appreciate your information, feedback on, on this one, as well as your information on what future directions and, and webinars we can, we can present. As a reminder, check out our, our website, cap.unl.edu, for a schedule of, of more webinars coming. We have one coming up next week uh, featuring Dr. David Cole from retired professor emeritus from Virginia Tech University. Uh, David is well known across the country and, and uh, widely spoken here across the state, uh, but he's joining us uh, on the webinar to talk about uh, business and financial IQ in managing the farm and ranch today. So again, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your attention uh, to this issue and to the many uh, issues we address here at UNL uh, through our new Center for Ag Profitability. Uh, we appreciate your participation and, and wish you a good day.